Hi, welcome back to the Dowie Podcast. My guest today is Ken Gullett. Ken has more than, has about half a century of experience in teaching and training in martial arts. He's the uh, creator of several martial arts instructional videos and author of numerous books, including Signposts on a Martial Arts Journey, Tai Chi, Shingi, Bagua, and the Art of Life. Ken has his own online popular his own popular online martial arts school at internalfightingarts.com and has combined his several decades of experience in broadcast journalism into the Internal Fighting Arts podcast, which is an outstanding podcast that I highly recommend. Ken, thanks for joining me today. Thank you. So I guess we'll start at the beginning. Uh, how did you get started on this journey? How did you get started in the martial arts? Um, like a lot of people my age, uh, uh, I watched the Kung Fu TV show back in the early 70s. I was fascinated by the fight scenes, of course, um, but I was also interested in the philosophy. And then Bruce Lee hit in 1973, and uh, I just watched Enter the Dragon, and it was so beautiful, his movements, that I wanted to uh, start studying. So I enrolled the next month. And that was uh, 50 years ago this September. Wow. And uh, for some people, you know, it just becomes a way of life. Other people get in and go away. It's not their interest. But I also uh, became very interested in uh, reading about Taoism and Zen Buddhism and the philosophy that really gives substance to some of this. Yeah, that's an important part of it. Um, I think that's might be one of the things that keeps us going as, as we get older is that there's there's more and more to explore in the philosophical side, you know. Yeah, I've been working for about three years on a, a book about how I've used the philosophies in a, my adult life, including uh, the death of my daughter. It's, uh, it, you know, it really is. The philosophy is, is paid lip service in a lot of schools, but uh, it's really something that can help you day to day. I agree wholeheartedly. So what was your first art? The first art was called uh, Shaolin Do Karate <laughs> by Grandmaster Sente in Lexington, Kentucky. Yeah. You mentioned... Uh... Uh, Enter the Dragon. I, I believe that Jim Kelly, who was in that film, also was a student of Sinte to begin with before he. You know, yeah, I heard that. He wasn't from Lexington. That was my hometown. And that's where Sinte was based. He came from Indonesia, I believe, to study engineering mm -hmm. at the University of Kentucky. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's a. Uh, uh, Jim Kelly was apparently a student for a while. So uh, how long were you there? How long did you study that that art before you? I was there most active until 1976. I got a third degree brown belt. And we did a, uh, I went to a tournament up in Columbus, Ohio, that we weren't allowed really to go to. But I decided to go anyway. And it was, uh, it just blew me away what I saw up there. Yeah. And so I decided to start studying other styles and um, went back for a tournament at Sente, that Sente held in 1980. And that was a lot of fun. Yeah, I've, I've seen a little snippet of video from that. <laughs> <laughs> Very enjoyable. Yeah, Bill Leonard, I think he's still like one of the senior masters of that style. He was the center referee on yeah. the video you probably saw. Yeah, I saw it. Um, you know, people are interested in that um, video. It's on Ken's uh, YouTube channel uh, under uh, Sinte Martial Arts Tourney, 1980 Martial Arts Tourney. I think it's it's a short video, but it's well worth a watch. <laughs> I had perfected my hook kick by that point. You sure did. <laughs> uh, so, what was your what was your next art after that art? Did you were you? Uh... Um, I studied Taekwondo. There's a black belt named. Uh, Crawford, Roy Crawford in Lexington. I think he still teaches. In fact, I haven't seen him in decades, but I I should look him up when I go back to town. Um, and then he had a teacher at one point, Randy Chambliss. So I studied Taekwondo enough to get to a green belt, which isn't that high, but uh, it was fun. 
and I enjoyed it at the time. And then after that, I moved to Cincinnati to work in TV, and I briefly took up uh, Tian Shan Pai Kung Fu with uh, Karen Vaughn. And she was well known at the time uh, on the tournament circuit in the Midwest. Uh, but I didn't stay long. I had two small children and working uh, at the TV station, and that took up a lot of my time. When did you start, first start to branch out into what you know people refer to as eternal martial arts, like Shingi or Tai Chi? Yeah. Uh, in 1987, I lost my job at, in Cincinnati. And I moved to Omaha to work at a TV station there. And uh, uh, I was looking in the phone book and I saw uh, Pete Starr's school, Philip Starr. And uh, I called and went in and started there and uh, started over again, martial arts, which you have to do from time to time. So he studied, he taught more Yang style Tai Chi Xing Yi and Bagua, and uh, designed a couple of forms on his own. But one of the important things I learned there, he really made being connected part of the art, part of every movement. And every time you worked with a partner, you're supposed to connect. And, and uh, so he was actually the first person who put the philosophy into action in his art. And for that, I owe him a real debt of gratitude. Yeah. I, so that was an eye opener for you. You could you could finally see the things that you sort of read about or, um, in being put into practice. Yeah. And you could really then take that and not only be connected to your opponent, hmm. but become the opponent and and take that then to the person you meet in the store. I'm connected to them and. um take it to the whole world and other other creatures it's it's fascinating and really help helpful i think for a good life yeah i agree there's a it works on a lot of levels and you know i think that people when they stay with it for longer than you know five or so years when you really start to get into it you find that um yeah that the, the fighting part is an important part but it it's a use in your day-to-day -day life is almost limitless yeah and i just turned 70 and that really plays with your head. And uh, I started practicing to all of you, you know, I'm, I'm much better can I get. Yeah. Physically, a lot of people, their bodies start really failing after 70 and uh, you just uh, practice. Just don't, don't worry about it. Just do what is fun and enjoyable in the moment. How do you continue to improve yourself at your age? You've been doing this for a long time. What, what do you focus on on a day-to-day -day basis as far as your training goes? Yeah, I'm, I'm fascinated with the body mechanics. Um, what makes these arts so gentle in their movement and powerful in their self-defense capabilities and I still study. I've got a teacher I study with, Nabil Rane. He's in Berlin. He is a disciple of Chen Yu um, in Chen Tai Chi. And so, and he came to Philadelphia in May and we met him there and trained for a few days. And he's coming back this May. He's planned to be there. But studied Bagua with a couple of disciples of. Uh, Lu Jing Ru and the Xing Yi, I think, uh, you know, I, I don't study extra, but although I did study a little bit online with uh, Byron Jacobs, who I think is very talented. So what I try to do now is just, I try to improve in Chen Tai Chi, that's my main art, but I like to occasionally check my skill level by uh, learning from other teachers in Bagua and Xingyi. I want to make sure what I'm teaching is good quality. <laughs> sure. From what I've heard it is, I've run into a lot of your online students, so oh, they, they're you. all pretty happy with what you teach, I think. Did you find, do you find that your um, Xingyi and Bagua practices, uh, you know, improved your Tai Chi practice? Uh, just the opposite. Oh, is that right? Yeah. yeah. 
when I, uh, I studied Yang style for more than 10 years. Mm. I got a gold medal for the Young 24 forum at the 1990 AAU championships. And, uh, and I thought I really know Tai Chi. And then I met my first Chin style teacher. And an hour later, I walked away and and said, I've got to start over again. <laughs> Everything I do is empty. Mm. I don't know Tai Chi. Mm. The difference in the body mechanics is just so amazing that that became a, a real passion of mine. Yeah. So who was your first Chen Tai Chi teacher? Jim Krishamanya. Okay. He lived in Rockford, Illinois. I, I live in the Quad Cities. It's on the board of Iowa and it's about two and a half hours from Chicago to the West. And I was on a list serve with some practitioners and and back in the internet in 97, I asked them, uh, I, they talked about things I'd never heard of, ground path, oh, yeah. tongue jam. And so I asked, is there a master in the Chicago area I could go visit? And they, they laughed at me because so many people call themselves masters, but <clears throat> they don't believe there are many. And it's probably true. But so they sent me to Jim and that, I just changed my trajectory at that point. So the body mechanics I learned there uh, really informed my Xing Yi and my Bagua. Okay, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I found that um, I, I'm not, I'm more of a Xing Yi practitioner. I, I do practice um, Tai Chi and Bagua, but I've, I've found that Tai Chi and Bagua help my Xing Yi because it helps me to be, you know, uh, more connected, less stiff, you know, more relaxed. So that's, I think that's really in Xing Yi. I'm, so I was at a tournament and the, a series of tournaments where this one particular judge kept scoring me low. And I would generally do Xing Yi in the tournament because they were karate and taekwondo judges, so they didn't understand Tai Chi or Bagua. And this judge, uh, I finally, after one performance, walked over and I said, you know, I noticed you always score me low. Do you have any advice for me? And she said, you move through your forms like the house is on fire. So you need more pacing. Mm. And I thought, I looked at my the video and I thought, yeah, she's right. So that relaxation and the storing and releasing really uh, adds a lot to the, the art and it helps other people see the power in it too. Yeah, I agree. So you a lot of people would be surprised because you have such a friendly, you know, laid back demeanor that you're actually pretty big on uh, pressure testing yourself in your martial arts. You've, you've fought in a lot of tournaments. You've even been in a tough man competition or two, if I'm not mistaken. Um, how important is that to you um, to be able to, um, you know, the, how, how important is the uh, martial uh, efficiency of your movement testing? it? Uh, yeah, I was picked on by bullies when I was a kid. If there were 20 kids standing around and a bully came up, he would look at me and say, you. Yeah. But once the fight started, it, even though I tried to avoid it, once it started, I really enjoyed it. Yeah. It's the perfect one-on-one -on -one competition. Hmm. And so um, I've always looked at the, at the internal arts as multifaceted but these movements are such powerful applications i want to unlock every one of them i did a dvd series on one form and there are more than 400 applications in that form wow it's that is my main interest when i study and practice not only getting the body mechanics right but also uh, working on the secrets of the applications. When you teach, is that something that you emphasize a lot? Is, is the applications, you demonstrate that in your online teaching? Yeah. And if an application doesn't work, 
out it goes. Also that, yeah. You know, you see a lot of people do applications and I was trained with some applications and against someone who is halfway motivated, it just doesn't work. I see women being taught applications at times that wouldn't work in a against a motivated, strong male attacker. Um, and so my wife left. I was going to pull her down here if we. Yeah. Sort of go free. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's important. Uh, I think, I, you know, I'm sure that you've had this experience, too, but I've been, you know, I've had a lot of teachers and gone to a lot of schools and at some schools, you know, um, of course, you, you you want to build confidence in people, but you don't want it to be a, a, a false confidence. And I've right. seen a lot of schools where, you know, when the instructor will divide people up to practice techniques, you know, sometimes they'll they'll put two two women together or or a woman with a male that's close to her size. And, you know, that might be OK, you know, to begin with to work on things. But I think it, it's a it sets a bad precedent because, you know, in, in a real life situation, you're most likely going to be getting I've never been attacked by someone smaller than myself. You know, right. uh, yeah, uh, it doesn't. I'm sure it happens, but it doesn't happen often. No, I hadn't. Fortunately, I haven't been in a fight since I was 18. So uh, but there's always the potential, although that's one thing that the Taoist part of the art helps you do you calm center relax connect with the other person so you don't i've diffused several situations uh by doing that but yeah that's uh i'm sorry where were you going with with that <laughs> i was just i was just talking about how like in, in some schools they're they're uh tend not to have a realistic uh training method as far as is learning that you know like you were saying, a motivated attacker, and, and sometimes it's, it's not not a whole lot of resistance um, uh, provided. Yeah, there's a I saw someone demonstrating a technique with a woman. Okay, you're strangled like this, and what do you do? And I showed her, taught her to take one hand down under under one of his arms and around, and then do an arm bar. And I said, okay. Try that on me, and I wouldn't do it. it hurt. When someone is motivated, you, I tell my wife, hey, if you're ever attacked, really, we're trained to be nice, and we, we're trained to say to ourselves, if I just cooperate, they won't hurt me. But sometimes uh, a finger to the eye yeah. is a very fast way to end something. You just have to have the nerve to do it. Right, yeah. And that's one of the problems. One time I was surrounded with a cousin by a group of boys who were our age and older, and one of them had a stick, and he was threatening with it as the others surrounded us. And I thought, all right, I can take that stick out of his hands. I really can do it. So I grabbed it and they ran off screaming because I had the stick. Right. Yeah. And I thought the difference in effective self-defense and non-effective is taking action when you have to. And I think a lot of people hold back at a moment when they need to act. Yeah, I agree. It's all about changing the other person's mind you know, one way or another, I think. Yeah, nobody wants to hurt anyone. No. Uh, I had a student who was 16 and he, we practiced joint locks and we practiced one where they grab you, you clamp the, the lapel, put your elbow over theirs and drop down. It's, it's a lock. And we do it and no one gets hurt in my practices. I don't want to hurt anyone. I don't want anyone to hurt me. Sure. But his drunk stepfather grabbed him, reared back to hit him, and he went and shattered the guy's elbow. He was never bothered again. Yeah, I'd say not. These things work, and it's just a matter of practicing and, and not hurting anybody. <laughs> yeah, you <laughs> to definitely want to be nice to your training partners, that's for sure. You want to train with. <laughs> so one of the things that I really like about um, 
your teaching and about your podcast too, is that um, you have a very healthy skepticism when it comes to these types of things. And, uh, you know, um, you know, at the beginning of your podcast, you know, the intro to your podcast, one of the things you say is never, never check your mind at the door of a martial arts studio. Um, so we live in a time with, because of the internet where there's really never been this much good information out there, but there's still a lot of not very good martial arts teachers out there and, and still a lot of students who are either not motivated to find out what's good or for whatever reason, you know, still seek out instruction. That's maybe not the best thing for them. Do you, do you feel like it's the responsibility of a martial arts teacher to call out other bad teachers? <sighs> I never criticize anyone's skill. Yeah. I don't mean so much skills. I mean, you know, maybe someone is teaching something that's, uh, well, for instance, like something that where they, um, there's a lot of talk about mysticism or, you know, yeah. things of that nature. That's more of what on the lines of what I meant. I've been calling out uh, the chi master frauds for 22, three years, 1999, I think. Uh, Inside Kung Fu ran my challenge on the front page. I will give anyone $5,000 yeah. if, if they can. Uh, if they are tr pretending they can knock someone down without touching them or barely touch them and have the person jump back and show me your demonstration. And I, if I believe it's fraudulent, I will give you five thousand dollars if you do it on me. <laughs> yeah. Have you had any takers at all? No, no takers. Not one. <laughs> and uh, I've challenged a few people, and in a very friendly way, I say, you know, I just don't believe that works. I'll give you five thousand dollars if it does. But I think we live in a time where, even though our technology has gotten better. The instruction of our martial arts has gotten better. Um, we still want to believe what we want to believe, and we are fooled, and we fool ourselves. And so it, it's it's in politics, it's in religion, yeah. it's in martial arts. You, you once someone is invested financially. Um, it's uh, it takes a lot of internal strength to to realize I'm being taken here. This isn't quite right for me. Yeah. So let's go a different path. It happened to me in my first internal arts school, yeah. and uh, there were demonstrations that were being put on and claims being made, and I thought. That just uh, isn't right, isn't realistic. Yeah, I think I think a lot of us have had that experience. I know I have. Um, and it, it's hard for some people to walk away, particularly when they've had, you know, uh, quite a bit of time and effort, you know, invested in an art or if they live in an area where there's nothing else available. You know, they. They have a tough time walking away from their friends or convincing their friends that maybe it's not the right thing. That's it's a true. Common experience, unfortunately. There are some good teachers online, and uh, so there are other methods available now to right. find and train with someone good. But uh, yeah, it, it takes a lot of strength. Uh, I, I've never had the problem of changing when I get good information. I grew up in a conservative Christian environment. I decided after reading about Taoism, after watching the Kung Fu show, I thought, wow, that's a peaceful way to look at the world. Yeah. Let me explore this a little bit. And I realized that was actually more suitable for me. So, yeah, it's just a matter of remaining, keeping an open mind and not, but not so open that your brains fall out, as they say. That's the key. So is, is Taoism something that you focus on primarily as a, a philosophy rather than, you know, the religious aspect of it? Oh, yeah, I'm much more of a lean toward the philosophy more than the theology. Yeah. I, I, gosh, that's been over 40 years ago. I decided to make that change. Wow. And it's an interesting, the debates I've gotten into over the years and the people who will 
not be your friend anymore because you don't believe in the religion that you were taught to believe in. Yeah. It's very sad. Uh, yeah, it is. But it's just another one of those instances where I'm invested. And if you're, if you say you don't believe in my chi powers or my God or whatever, then you're, you're, you're kind of saying I'm wrong. Yeah. People don't want to hear that. That's, that's true. It's true. Some things never change, I guess, you know, no matter how much information is out there. You, know, so, you go your own way and be honest with yourself and true to yourself and have fun. Yeah. That's all. Enjoy every moment and uh, yeah. <laughs> So uh, how does your online school work? Do you want to talk about that for a little bit? Um, how does it happen? Um, I've made about a thousand instructional videos since wow. 2008. And um, some of them are out on DVD, but a lot of them aren't. And I make new material. And I explore Xing Yi Tai Chi, Bagua Chen Tai Chi from start to more advanced material. And it's all on the website to stream at any time. And um, I hold at least two and sometimes up to four classes live a week. Oh, so members join the classes. And, and uh, lately I've gotten to the point where I, I don't start a forum and do that week after week until I'm done because a lot of people miss some and they feel like they're behind. So I... Generally, in my class, live classes, I do principles and body mechanics, and that is a has been very helpful. So, no matter where someone is, what form they're studying, they can get something out of it. That's great. Do you do you teach uh, in person at all these days? I have a few local students, and we get together in the warm weather. We're together two or three times a week. Yeah, and I. If people want to come in, that's good. I don't recruit local people, but every now and then someone starts. Train outside, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and I do a friend's Facebook page for his Kung Fu school, and he lets me use his facility then to record videos and practice. Oh, that's great. So in the wintertime, we only have usually one practice a week. <laughs> Yeah. Training outside is where it's at. I, I really enjoy training outside. Oh, yeah. It's beautiful. We train in a park on a stage, oh. and it's, it's really nice. Nice. So let's talk about your podcast for a second. Uh, I'm a big fan of podcasts. You have some really yeah. quality guests. <laughs> um, so when did you start that? How long ago did you start that? I think December 2014 was my first one. And, uh, yeah, I'm... I'm a little picky about my guests. I I want them to be uh, people who are skilled and have ties to masters who are uh, skilled. And so, I, I, some people do suggest guests who I think I look into them and realize some are a little much into the woo woo for me. Yeah. I think it's paid off for you. You have a very high quality guest list. Very thank good. you. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Um, well, I hope you do too after today. <laughs> yeah. you, you class the joint up some. <laughs> so we're getting some good people on here. Um, I'm looking forward to talking to more people too. But um, I do. You know, I think this is great to have a video podcast like this. I have not done one. And sure. what I want to do is. For example, I'll show you something. Sure. I was excited to, to have this opportunity. One of the things I've been really driving home with my students lately has been the difference between shifting your weight externally and internally. And I see so many people in Tai Chi shifting their weight and their hips are moving in space. When the qua, the, the crease at the top of the leg, when I'm shifting my weight, I fold, I relax into that qua. 
and then shift weight into the other one. And I don't know why that is so hard for people. Notice my hips move a little, but not as much as this way. Right. And that's one of the things online you can really, you can correct the ground and the pung and the spiraling. It's easy to see. And uh, that's one of the things I've been really driving home lately. Yeah, that's an important point. And I think, I think the reason a lot of people move that way is because maybe some people, when it was demonstrated to them, you know, sometimes teachers will exaggerate a movement so that the student can sort of pick up on the idea. But rather than pick up the idea, they just pick up the movement and imitate, you know, the movement. I think that's that's why that uh, isn't isn't done correctly a lot of times. But, yeah, that's an important point. So those are the kinds of things I like to, you know, I'd like to do a more video podcasts where I have a guest on that demonstrate things rather. Yeah, I think people would enjoy that. Yeah. So uh, in addition, to, you, you said that you had a new book that you were working on. How, how close are you to finishing that? I'm working hard on it. I, I tell you, I see so many self-published books that are really bad. Yeah. And I really don't want it to be bad. <laughs> it's a different kind of book. It's not a how-to. It, it Maybe a little bit, but it's mostly, uh, I mean, it, it's going down a rabbit hole on part of it where I'm we discovered our daughter was dead and going into that that was the first time i really used Taoist philosophy zen philosophy Taoism, to guide myself in such a tragic situation and so i'm trying to trying to write to, about that and other things as well and just make it a good book instead of just me talking about stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm talking about starting even in second grade, how I learned a really important lesson about honesty and the violence, some of the violence and rage that I experienced at home um, and how that led me to, I believe that kind of thing leads you toward a philosophy of peace, centering uh, rather than the fire and brimstone, you're going to be tortured for eternity if you don't believe in me. Yeah. That, it's a really an interesting topic, I believe. I agree. And I, I think that, you know, someone like myself, that's, you know, I've, I've been practicing martial arts since I was 10 years old and uh, grew up in a similar environment to what you grew up in, I imagine, but my, my family life wasn't like that, but all the, all the rest of the, the people around me were sort of like that, you know, the whole fire and brimstone, so on and so forth. And, you know, um, I, I think that, you know, after you read so many books, how-to books about martial arts and things and historical books about martial arts, those things are really valuable. But when you get to a certain point, reading somebody's personal story is so much more interesting and so much more valuable because there's only so much that you can learn as far as technique from a book. You know, they always say that you can't learn Kung Fu from a book. You know, you can learn some things, but uh, as yeah. far as the philosophy and how to put the philosophy into your use in your everyday life, that is something that you can get a pretty good um, guideline from, from a book, because we all have a lot of common experiences, you know, and can relate to things in each other's lives. I think so. Yeah. I'm, I, I think we need more books like that, actually. Um, I'm reading one right now by Michael Dorgan, who, who uh, was like me. He was in the news business, and he, I think he uh, used philosophy. I, mean, I haven't gone too far in the book, but uh, still trying to get through it. Uh, but yeah, I, mine is a little different. I try to also use humor because that's very important to me in my daily life. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, did, I get my wife to laugh several times a day, and that's just wonderful. But uh, so it has, I want it to reflect my personality and yet be high quality. It's hard to do. Yeah. yeah and being so personal, too, I'm sure it's, it's, it's tough to do. So tough things to work through. And it's a lot easier to talk about body mechanics. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I imagine so. Yeah. 
I'm, I'm trying to look when I talk to some of the people who have been around for a while, you know, I, I really do encourage them to like to put down into memoirs, their experiences and things about their teachers and things like that, because it's a, uh, these things sort of tend to go in, in waves, you know, um, you know, we've got a lot of um, uh, older people right now that have a lot of experiences that uh, the younger ones are not ever going to have, you know, and a lot of people like the first wave of, you know, teachers that came over here from, you know, Asia in the, in the sixties and seventies, a lot of them are, you know, passing on now and, their students, some of them are still around, you know, to pass these stories on. So I think it's really important that people put those down on paper too for future generations. One of the things I try to do is uh, in the podcast is talk to these martial artists who have sacrificed so much and and gone to such great lengths to travel and seek out masters of these arts. It's something I wish I had thought about when I was younger and not caught up in the job and the, you know, you have to have money to do that, to yeah. go uh, abroad and seek out teachers. That's uh, true. Yeah, it's 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 uh, quite an achievement to do that, and I admire people who do. I do too. It, it, it comes with a cost also, though, besides the, the, the financial cost, you know, like you said, you know, you had a career, you know, that you're focusing on a family that you're focusing on some of some of these people have to sacrifice part or all of that you know to get this uh, education that they get so that's a good point the trade-off yeah. and I read, uh, when i was in news i read that uh, dan rather spent 10 years just in an airplane traveling to and from stories my gosh that's horrible i thought and walter cronkite by the end of his life said his biggest regret was that he was working more than uh, he didn't see his kids growing up. So mm -hmm. yeah, you can pay a price for things they don't you don't realize. There are things that I was close to death in Cleveland Clinic. It's a pretty well known story. Doctors almost killed me and <laughs> pierced my heart with a wire, and I was. Uh, Man, there is not one time when I was laying there with a breathing tube and everything that I thought, I wish I had worked a little harder yeah. in my job. Yeah. I was thinking, well, one, I was thinking, okay, I'm not ready to leave Nancy. <laughs> we hadn't been married that many years at that point. And two, there was a martial arts tournament coming up in six months. I really wanted to compete on it. Uh, yeah. And did That's you? Awesome. I'm not, I did. <laughs> got, got first in forms. <laughs> oh, wow. I was breathing like a freight train at the end of it, having lost a lung. But, yeah. A lot of, <laughs> that, that's dedication right there. I, a lot of people just don't. I, I think that that's something that, that students need to keep in mind. You know, when, when they're when they're learning from a teacher, there might be some the fees some tuition involved. But the, the, the things that people have gone through to get the knowledge that they're passing on to you has to be taken into account. You know, it's not just like going and getting a golf lesson or something like that. You know, it's a there's a there's a lot on the line there. A lot of people. And when I teach, I try to. My, my goal is to cut the time down that it takes you to get this knowledge yeah I'll give you the knowledge now you put in the work but i mean it takes decades to find teachers who will give you the knowledge you need absolutely some teachers say they have it but they don't and you have to wade through those until you get to the people who do i think that's part of it it's frustrating it's almost like a trick because um you know, I, I had good teachers when I was younger, but now that I'm that I'm older, I have many good teachers, very good teachers. And uh, but uh, I think to myself, well, you know, now I'm, you know, I'm middle aged, you know, and I wish I had all this when I was, you know, in my 20s. But I think that's I, part of it. You look pretty young to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, you know, the, I think it's true in all walks of life. There there are a lot of people who just don't know how to teach when i was in news young kid trying to make his way i went years without anyone really giving me solid advice 
And when I became news director in charge of the newsroom, um, 1980, actually it was after 87, it was 89. And uh, I decided I wanted to help each person achieve their goals by sitting them down and brainstorming and what do you need to do to get better? And the same is true in martial arts. I see schools where the teacher isn't really coaching someone on mechanics and how to do it a little bit better. It's just uh, human nature, I think. Some people can and will teach and some can't. Yeah. Yeah, there's many talented um, martial artists out there that are not great at teaching. And there's also some talented martial arts out there, martial artists out there, unfortunately, that that don't really want to teach. They, they will teach, but they do, it's like they don't want their students to surpass them, which is the exact opposite of what I would want. Yeah, I think that would be a mark of showing me as being a good teacher if, you know, yeah. students yeah. surpass me. I guess it's a, just a difference in personal philosophy. Yeah, I I, I don't spar like I used to, but I used to uh, enjoy padding up and going at it. Um, I would always love it when a student would get a shot in on me. Yeah. But not only it showed they were getting pretty good, but uh, it helped me explore my weaknesses and what I had to do to get better. Yeah. It's a nice reality check. Yeah. <laughs> People that are into that sort of thing. <laughs> excuse me i have to take a sip from my bruce lee mug by all means oh that's quite nice i'll join you. so ken we're just about out of time would you uh got anything that you'd like to promote here promote yes oh not really not really i'm just glad to meet someone who's interested in some of these philosophical issues and yeah, talk a little bit. I hate to talk about me the whole time. <laughs> that's what this is. This is that's what this is about. And it's talking about you. <laughs> I think it's interesting, though. To uh, as I hit seventy, and you think uh, the road ahead, and and you just have to stop and enjoy it. And and I meet so many people who someone's like fifty, and he says, "Oh, I'm too old to do this stuff." I said, well, "Are you kidding me?" You've got 20 years that you could, yeah. you know, do really well. So too old not to do it is what, what I say. You're too old not to do it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's good. Yeah. So Ken Gullett, uh, it's internalfightingarts.com is the school. Um, the blog is also internalfightingarts.com and then the podcast, Internal Fighting Arts. Yeah, the blog is uh, internalfightingartsblog.com. Okay. Yeah. Right. But, yeah. Thank you very much.